Hello, my name is Dr. Linda McIver and I run the Australian Data Science Education Institute. We're a charity dedicated to helping kids understand data. Today I want to look at what it means to flatten the curve and why it's important. But before I start talking about that, I want to make a few points about the data that we do have. The first is that when we talk about the number of people who have coronavirus, we're actually talking about the number of people who've been tested and confirmed as having coronavirus. We don't actually know the total number of people who have the virus unless we can test the entire population, and we simply don't have the resources to do that. We're running out of test kits, so we're only testing the people who have a high chance of having it. This is what I call proxy data in that it's a proxy for the data we really want, because the data we want is how many people have coronavirus right now, and the data we have is how many people have tested positive for having coronavirus. So the number of um, cases that any country reports is entirely dependent on how many people they're testing, not just on how many people actually have the virus. So most of the numbers we use are talking about the number of people who've tested positive as though they are the number who actually have the disease. And the sad fact is that the number who actually have it is likely to be much, much higher. Okay, so let's get back to flattening the curve. Why does it matter? If everyone is pretty much going to get coronavirus anyway, why do we care when they get it? Well, conservative estimates currently suggest that if you get COVID-19, you have a 10% chance of needing intensive care. It might be closer to 20%, but let's work with 10% as our guesstimate. So 10% of cases of coronavirus are going to need intensive care. In Australia, we have 1,485 public hospital intensive care beds and 538 in the private system. So let's assume that public or private won't matter in a crisis and that neither does location. This is a huge simplification since you're, if you're in a regional town or remote location, your access to intensive care beds is much more limited, but it will give us some initial understanding. So in total, we have 2,023 intensive care beds. This is according to numbers I found from 2010. It may have changed a little in the last 10 years, but likely not much. So let's flip over to our spreadsheet and see how soon we run out of intensive care beds. And we'll start by looking again at these ex uh, exponential growth curves we saw in the video on exponential growth. I'm back in our exponential growth spreadsheet, and now we're looking at the number of intensive care beds needed. Australia is currently still doubling, according to the World Health Organization, every three days. So let's put that in there. Day one plus three, and extend that out so we can see where we're at, what day we're hitting this number of cases. Now, intensive care. We know that 10%, which is 10 on 100, times the number of cases is how many people will need intensive care. Initially, that's 0.1 and that's no big deal, and it's 0.2, and that's no big deal, 0.4, still no big deal, 0.8, 1.6, 3.2, these numbers aren't scary, right? And this is the point where we're currently at, where the numbers aren't scary, and so we're not doing enough about it. But we hit the point between day 43 and day 46 where we have maxed out our intensive care beds. So 46 days from the first case being confirmed. Right, now remember, this is not the number of cases we have in the country. This is the number of cases we have confirmed in the country, the number of cases we've detected, essentially. And 45 days after that, we have maxed out our intensive care beds. Now, the problem with this data also is that this assumes that intensive care beds were just lying empty, that our, the entire intensive care capacity of our hospitals was not being used. And of course, we know that's not the case. People need intensive care for all kinds of reasons, car accidents, um, heart attacks, recovering from surgery, all kinds of um, major conditions require people to be intensive care. So our intensive care system is pretty much set up to have the number of beds that we need at any given time. And now we're proposing to say, oh, we need another 3,000 and we'll need it really soon. So obviously that's not sustainable, which is why we're doing the social distancing thing. So what happens if we can use social distancing to move the doubling time out to, let's say, 10 days? So again, we start at day one. The next day is that day plus 10 and we extend that out. All right, now we're maxing out between 141 and 151 days. That's a lot different to between 43 and 46, gives us a lot more time. 
and that more time gives us the capacity to increase our intensive care beds, maybe convert some ordinary hospital beds to intensive care if we have the necessary equipment and the necessary staff, but it also gives patients time to recover. So we know that patients are needing intensive care for between one and two weeks when they need intensive care because of coronavirus. And this is 10 days between this number of 1,600 and this number of 3,200. And that means that a lot of these patients will have recovered and moved on out of intensive care, which drops this number down, essentially close to half. But of course, that doesn't buy us much because at 161 days, again, we're up to six and a half thousand. And that's way more than we can manage, even if 3,000 have already recovered. So we're, we're still going to max out the capacity of the intensive care beds unless we can really slow it down dramatically. 10 days is going to help, but it's not going to be enough. We're still going to hit the point um, where we have potentially a million people have coronavirus at 200 days and that's 104,857 intensive care beds needed and we just can't manage that at all. So we need to slow down the growth and we need to slow it down dramatically and that's why this social distancing needs to be taken incredibly seriously and why we're all going to be working from home, we're probably going to be schooling from home and we're not going to be going out and hanging out at the local cafe or going to the movies. We're going to be hanging out at home and hoping that we can slow down this rate of growth so that our health system can cope with it. This has been another Data Science Explainer from the Australian Data Science Education Institute. We hope you've got something useful from it. Please feel free to find us on Twitter, on email, or on the web. And if you really like our work, you can donate at givenow.com.au forward slash adsy to support the making of these videos and the creation of data science resources to make sure that Australian kids get data science skills. Thanks, and I'll see you soon with more videos.